This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Genya Raven on January 20th in New York for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. It's an honor to meet you. We're both very excited. Thank you. I'm excited too. Yeah. Um, so like I just said, you know, I've read your book and I apologize if some of this is a little repetitive, but if you could talk a bit about your early childhood in Poland before you moved to the U.S.? And they were really young, so... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, from what I remember, uh, the chaos, th that seems to be the only thing I remember is all the chaos of um, being on crowded trains and um, at one point, uh, you know, we were on the steps of the train going over a bridge and... Uh, I keep thinking they were gypsies in the um, in, inside these trains, you know. It was like cattle cars, you know. And, but it could have been people with a lot of clothes on carrying whatever they could. You know, we were escaping from somewhere. I don't remember that. I remember waiting on lines for food. I remember trucks pulling up with shoes. This is, I think, the Russian side. I'm not sure. Because I was really, uh, I was very young. But the reason I remember the uh, train and being on the steps is I was on my father's back holding him. <clears throat> and my mother had my sister on her back. And my father was on the outside of them, holding them on the inside. And he's on way at the end with me totally on the end. And he's saying to my mother, <clears throat> her name is Yaja in Polish. And he's saying to her, I can't hold on anymore. I can't hold on. So naturally, I remember that because the horror of falling was major for me, you know. So there's, there's so many memories like that. Um, if, if you're asking for good memories, forget it. Yeah. None. Doesn't... None in Poland. The only one good memory I have is... Um, my father carrying me on his shoulders and people singing. I don't know where it was, you know. I have no idea, but that was the only nice thing I remember in a childhood. And of course, coming to the United States, I remember on the ship, parts of it. And my sister, who was older than me, she doesn't remember any of it. But when we came to the United States, they said, don't Remind her, this is probably something that she should not remember. You know, they believed then that, you know, don't wake that, that fear in her. Yeah. You know, so. Um, well, and you just mentioned, can you talk a bit about your move to the, to the U.S.? Your, I read that your family didn't speak any English at all. Um, yeah, none of us but did. overall, just like what the transition was like and you were seven or eight I was seven and uh, uh, none of us spoke English I mean you know so uh, and my mother didn't speak English way way later than me I mean she she didn't even understand it which was great because I could walk around the house saying fuck all the time and she never knew what that meant <laughs> she what is this fuck anyway <laughs> her and her little Jewish accent um, you know, I've forgiven my parents for a lot of stuff. I know I'm jumping the gun right now because they were in concentration camps. My, my mother was 30 when she lost her whole family. That's young to be 30 and lose your sisters. And, you know, so, yeah, my mother was a little demented, you know. I mean, I would have been demented as well. Although I still am demented because of the way she brought me up. We'll get to that later. But anyway, no. Nobody spoke English. And how did I learn how to speak English? Through music. I had a little radio on Rivington Street. My address was 202 Rivington Street, which, by the way, on my um, one of my albums, I think it's the, um, not the Cheesecake Girl album, but the undercover one. I have my song called Rivington Street, 202 Rivington Street. And uh, it's, cool. it's quite the ballad. It's, you know, it's like my writing. It's pretty honest, brutally honest. Um, but anyway, so that's how I learned how to speak English is through R&B, doo-wop, you know. I used to get this little station that barely came in and I would have my ear glued to that radio every night 
and listen to songs like Sincerely and Dear One and Earth Angel. This is before your time, but I tell you, nothing like that. Well, those are my roots, you know. I mean, you'll hear that in my voice, whatever I sing. Mm -hmm. You'll hear my roots, you know. And I never put it together that... Um, I never put it together that 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 I became a singer with timing and 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 through all of that because everything was a beat for me. The English language was a beat for me. That's why today writing lyrics, I, I happen to be a good a good lyricist. It's a beat thing, you know, and and it stems from, you know, learning how to speak the language, you know, and uh, I don't think I ever had an accent. I mean, I have an accent, you know. If I go to England, they say I have an accent, you know. If I go to Brooklyn, they don't think I have an accent. <laughs> oh, see, I, you oh. said coffee when I walked in. Coffee! Yeah, it reminded me of my family. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, that's that's very New York, though, too, yeah. you know, coffee. I'm really not from Brooklyn. My, my parents had a house in Brooklyn. After we moved out, they decided to get a house instead of a tenement. <laughs> It's like plastic covers on a couch to save it from your children. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you stick in, on, in the summer to your couch and you freeze in yeah. the winter when you have plastic on your couches. Anyway, yeah. We'll probably get to, to more about um, your mother and stuff, but when, when you were younger, young kid in New York, what was your relationship like with your parents and siblings? Um... I don't know if you'd want to call it a relationship. It was, um, she was very demanding, my mother. My father was constantly working in the in the candy store. And then when they had a deli, he constantly worked there. So I hardly saw him. He'd come home at night and go to sleep um, because uh, he drank that much, you know. So I used to just think he was napping sometimes during the day. It wasn't that at all, you know. It was like he probably was passing out. So my mother was there helping him as well. The, as far as the relationship, there was none. It was just constant demands of be home right after school. Who, uh, who are you? Who are you with? If you don't come home, you know. A lot of um, I really felt like a prisoner in that house. I did not care for my parents. Would I have died for them? Yes. There was a love, no matter what. You love your mother. And uh, well, I can't, you know, I don't think I loved my father until I got older. My sister and I, well, they kind of like split us apart. My sister was the slave to them. She'd be there in the, in the candy store helping them all the time. She was two and a half years older than me. And I would be considered the baby. And they watched me like a hawk and, uh, you know, um, they were so afraid that something was going to happen to me. My father was afraid of me getting hooked up with a guy. I was fucking 11 years old, nine years old, you know? And uh, I just, I didn't get it. I got into a lot of trouble because of that too, uh, because I did a lot of sneaking and a lot of lying. And so for years after that, it was very easy to lie and sneak, you know? And, Matter of fact, when I stopped lying and sneaking, I really missed it. I know, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like being in AA and, and uh, I miss the, I miss the thought of, let's say, cocaine coming across town to get, to get to me. It wasn't the actual getting the cocaine. I miss the action of do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like the excitement, the chaos, the, the anticipation. Anticipation that's very, that's and all addictive. that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, so the, the whole childhood thing was based on sneaking and lying. And I mean, you know, the only true thing that ever happened. Well, I'm not going to get ahead of you. Go ahead. What else? Um, <laughs> so that was your home life. What was your experience in school and with your peers? Did, I mean, you said you got in trouble a lot. Horrible. You got in trouble at school. Well, yeah, I got in trouble. I... I'll give you an example. Um, I had um, I had dreams of when I was on Rivington Street. I had dreams of becoming um, known. I wanted to be known, and I don't know why. 
I have no idea. And so my plan was to start a fire in school in the bathroom with another girl. We're going to start a fire and then we're going to save the school. So none of this was meant to hurt anyone. It was just not really a thought out plan. <laughs> I raised my hand, said I had to go to the ladies room, you know, to the bathroom. Um, I went to the bathroom. There was toilet paper, which threw toilet paper in the waste basket and lit it. Okay. Went back to the room and the next thing, I mean, without hesitation, they didn't even give me a chance to save the school. The alarm goes off. We're all in the streets now. You know how they line you up in the streets out of the school. Next thing I know is why'd you do it? They're asking me. So, and that set me back with my parents like even more. It was like, it was horrible. The other thing is, I, I must say, um, you know, there's just so much here. I, my, my parents always blamed me probably for everything that ever happened in the world, okay? They had put money in my coat, one of the joints, I don't know if it was from Poland to Russia, to Russia to there. I don't know where we were going. There was a lot of traveling, a lot. I don't remember a house. It was just trains, trains, and trains, and, you know. And they put money in the liner of my coat. Okay, and I don't know how much it was. It couldn't have been a lot. I don't know. Maybe it was a lot. So when uh, we're interviewed uh, by the people that were in those offices, whatever, in train stations, they asked me, they said, do you have anything that your mother and father, in another language, of course. I went, yeah, there's money in the... <laughs> so they never let me live that down. Never, ever. We could have been rich. And I'm thinking, they probably put $10 in my coat, you know. But $10 then was $10, you know, is about 100 bucks today. You know, I don't know what it was. But so that was the end of my honesty. Okay. And honestly, it, things were never explained. It was just so chaotic. It was always chaotic. But so anyway, so yeah, trying to burn down the school, the, the, the police said, uh, you know, they showed me pictures of people that went away. They tried to scare me to make sure that I never do this again. My mother's crying, oh, you know, she's carrying on. Oh, we lost our families. That always got us out of trouble, you know, so. Um, How old were you? Well, I was still in, in PS4, so I must have been eight or nine. I never went to kindergarten. Quit school at 16, you know. Yeah. So I didn't really have school school. You yeah. know, I, I wasn't learning anything in school. My I had ADD, and, I, and my head was always somewhere else, always. Music basically saved my life because, think about it, I had a, a fork in the road many times, which way I could have gone you know, right up to my teens, you know, which way I could have gone. And what interested me was boys and music and motorcycles. You know, that was especially after seeing The Wild One with Marlon Brando. You know, that was it. That was that was going to be my ticket out of here. Big Holly Davidson. That was all three of your loves in one movie. My three loves. <laughs> Singing into Ralph's ear on the motorcycle going to California. Yeah. Running away from a marriage that I had never consummated. Because my parents basically forced me to marry him. This is when you were a teenager? 16. 16? Yes. And he was 28. To me, that was an older guy. And... Totally not my type. I always went with younger guys, always, you know. And uh, not then, but I mean, maybe because of him. I don't know. But, you know, even the guy I'm living with is 10 years, 11 years younger than me. Yeah, older guys, I, they scare me. <laughs> <laughs> How did your 
parents know who this guy was? He had a crush on me. It's, it's, it's such a, a long story. He was living in Brooklyn. My sister's boyfriend then introduced him to my family. He was Jewish, and that's all they had to know. But when he, they found out he had a lot of money, that was the end of it. So if I thought I was a prisoner before that, this was ridiculous. I could have done anything if I went with him. So I picked up a pack of cigarettes. I picked up my bottle of booze. I said, I'm quitting school. I got everything I wanted because I would marry him. And I said to him, I said, listen, I don't love you, but maybe I'll learn to love you. But you can't touch me. I'm a virgin and I want to keep it that way. Okay. <laughs> and I was. And I ran away from him. I, I uh, hitchhiked on Ocean Parkway, Brooklyn. And uh, I saw a big Harley Davidson coming down. And I stopped him. And I said, take me for a ride. And, and uh, he did. And I had a black leather jacket on. And he took me for a ride. We got to talking and I said, yeah, uh, I'm going to be running away soon. Um, he says, well, I'm going to California. I said, can you take me? And he says, yeah, I just got to wait for some money. I said, you see this diamond ring? I said, I had a, I had a four carat diamond ring on my hand at 16. What the fuck did that mean to me anyway? Who cared about diamonds? I had, when I married this guy, I had maybe four pairs of panties and, and, and three outfits. I had nothing. We were refugees, had nothing, you know? And um, so, so I pawned the ring and I left the guy I was married to the pawn ticket. And I said, if I ever come back to you, I'll make it up to you. <laughs> <laughs> the car is over here because I was already driving now I was 17 the car is on such and such corner the ring is at this and this pawn shop later so I ran away from everybody okay and I went to Manhattan Beach California where I dumped this guy and got into a lot of trouble because that was the first time I had any kind of freedom didn't know what to do with it and on top of that, I was broke. I didn't know how to handle anything. I wound up calling the guy that I was married to about a year later saying, send me money, I'm coming back. He thought I was coming back to him. Yeah. Rude awakening when you got back? Very rude awakening. <laughs> so what did you do for a year in Manhattan Beach? Getting in trouble. I was like living with guys. I was living with, you know, and, and believe it or not, still maintaining being a virgin. That's right. And what did you do? You said you didn't have any money. Did you work or what did you I do? didn't work. They were supporting me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one guy was a psychiatrist, a psychologist going to college. Another guy was his brother. <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble. His brother was a, was, was a bad boy and George was a good boy. And I was with George, who the good boy was, and I wanted his brother, who was the bad boy. And George found us in bed together. Not fucking. You know, so. Yeah. There were other things. <laughs> <laughs> there are other things. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how much of this you could use, but anyway. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, we use as much of it as we're allowed to use. Yeah, oh. This is a full, like, life history, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like, because you were still a teenager yeah. when all this was yeah. happening, which is yeah. insane. Yeah. But so you <laughs> you have this reputation of being like a bad, you know, the badass with right. the leather jacket and right, the cigarette. Right. Mm -hmm. but, and it's, but it seems like you've been that way for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, before you started playing music. Absolutely. Or, um, I was a I'm the original punk. I was well, definitely, you, were a kid. you know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, listen, I, I hid my leather jacket in a garbage can every night so my mother wouldn't catch it, yeah. wouldn't see it. How did you, I mean, do, was it, you mentioned listening to the radio and R&B, but how did you even 
discover like that kind of style or attitude or the attitude didn't go with the music I was singing the doo-wop has got nothing to do with being tough or anything my whole I think uh, personally I think this whole toughness came from being reprimanded all my life you know, coming from a family where they didn't allow me to be a child, they didn't allow... I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, I was crying for, for weeks. Everybody had roller skates, and my mother went finally and bought me roller skates and only gave me one so I wouldn't fall. I've been skating on one skate all my life because of that. That was painful for a child as funny as that is and it is funny i have to laugh about it she gave me one fucking skate so i, I thought maybe that was a metaphor no she actually, okay, she actually hid the other skate okay. from me okay talk about alienating me from the rest of the world that was like the the, the epitome of it i i had to cry for a pair of jeans because she wouldn't let me wear jeans so i think what happened was when I finally left the house and, and left this chaos of this marriage to this guy because he was Jewish and rich and, and finally got my feet on the ground, which happened with cheesecake modeling, which we'll get into, that was around that same time that I, uh, I finally started to make a great living at that time, doing cheesecake modeling, you know, but we'll get to that. Um, I think my toughness came from nobody is going to tell me what the fuck to do ever in my life again. Ever, you know? And I found myself also getting, uh, you know, well, we'll get to that later. That's called recording. But, you know, this, I think that whole persona was who I wanted to be. We're three people. Okay, all of us, who we want to be, who we see ourselves as, and who we really are. Okay, what I am is a big mush. I will cry at any given moment if, I, if somebody looks at me wrong. I'll give you an example. I could be performing in front of 5,000 people. This has happened. And everybody's clamoring and loving it and everything. There's one person that's not. I will zoom in on that one person until I see them accepting me. So to me, there's like, and fighting for it. You know, there's the toughness of it. You gotta love me. You gotta fucking love me. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, there's a psychological thing going on while singing as well, you know? And, you know, hence the drinking and the, anyone you talk to that, or read up about that had, um, especially in rock and roll, uh, the drinking problems and the drugging problems. If you've got a mental problem, which I did from the way I grew up, and somebody's offering you uh, stuff to get away from your head, you know, the longer you do that, the more you become the alky, you, it's all accessible. It's so accessible. My fans didn't come over and just say, I love you. They'd shake my hand and drop some pills in my hand. My roadies didn't, uh, you know, uh, ask me what I wanted on, uh, uh, they just had beers and drinks and everything in my dressing room. My uh, agents and managers, they didn't say, what do you want? They'd say, you want a couple of lines? You know, it was so accessible. I remember going to Germany when I was producing uh, Joy Rider and, and I walk in and I, I, I'm at Polydor Records and the head guy goes, here, have a schnapps, scan you? That means booze, you know. I said, it's 10 a.m. And I remember saying that. But, you know, eventually, 10, 7, 6, 5 a.m., it didn't matter, you know. I'd have to have it in my coffee to stop shaking. But that's what I'm saying. It's just so available. All of this shit was so available. So if you're not a really good, solid, stable person, I know people that drugged and drank as much as me. They went on to have a family and a career. Oh, I'm sorry. I just... It's okay. <laughs> they went on to have a family and a career. And, you know, and I know that because a girl came to visit me once. She says, you're an AA and everything. Kenya. She says, I, you know, I read your book and 
my God, we drugged and drank the same amount. And I was able to just stop. I said, therein lies deep-rooted alcoholism, you know? Alcoholism stems from a lot of places. DNA could be, you know? Um, I'd say the heaviness of feeling one thing and acting another way was just too much for me, you know? I remember telling a shrink, the only time I'm comfortable, and I know who I am, is when I'm on stage. The minute I, and that's only one hour. The minute I'm off stage, I'm lost. I'm totally lost. And she said, that's because you're playing the character that you created, that you have control over. Okay? So it's so deep-rooted, this shit. You know, you... Uh, it's very psychological, you know. If you talk to... Uh, even actors and actresses, like, I'll give you an example. You know who's very shy, believe it or not? Al Pacino. Oh, yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah. You know, you never, you say, wow, I mean, how do they do, like, you straw dogs and come out? And they're playing another character. They give themselves a character. You know? That's why acting is so, I always wanted to do acting, and, I, and basically that's what I do. I'm always acting. The real me is, is so messed up inside. And I'm working on it. I'm working on it constantly. It's like I said to you before, I went to Mexico and I was on my own for a month. I did a lot of soul searching. You know, there were no phones ringing. There was nowhere I could get lost in myself. I had to deal with me. You know, and it was kind of good. It was kind of good. But I don't want, I don't want you to walk away saying, oh, she's a fucking mess. You know, I'm not. I'm just getting in touch with myself, you know? And it's never too late to do that. And um, I'm, I, I, I'm very affectionate and I'm, I'm very loving and all of that. But also at the same time, in a drop of a hat, if, if I'm cornered, I will leash out like no one's business, you know? And I'm not afraid to. So... It's, it's not a split personality. It's just like, don't ever, ever either lie to me, don't corner me, don't question me. Been there and done that, you know? So that's why Goldie and the Gingerbreads was so good. Ginger basically helped me and my dreams, you know? She helped me and my dreams. Was the cheat? Was cheesecake modeling, but that was well before Goldie and the Gingerbread. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh huh. That and was... I would. Not, I don't think you're a mess at all. Thank you. That's the last thing that I was. Okay, thinking good. Thinking good because I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh. She no, I it. can yeah. identify with so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. And it, and if you listen to some of the songs I write, you yeah. can hear it all in there. Yeah. You know, what do I write about? Things that I know about. Mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to get in touch with myself, you know, and say, eh, it's good. But, you know, the cheesecake modeling, let me tell you what that is. Cheesecake modeling is when you don't show your pubics. So you're naked. Mm -hmm. I, I never minded showing my boobs. I had incredible boobs. Nobody even believed they were mine. Yeah. I remember during 10 wheel drive, this one chick said, those are not yours. I said, come here. I lifted my, I said, do you see any stitches anywhere? She goes, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had beautiful breasts, and yeah. anything that I was beautiful at, I would flaunt, yeah. okay? I never thought I was, you know, but I knew my body was. I had a good body, you know? And anywhere I could, I would show my tits, everywhere, including the Fillmore. I had body paint stars on my chest, and went out on stage, and they were red, and the lighting guy put red lights on, so... It just looked like I was standing there with my chastity belt and my tits out singing. I have pictures of this. They're in my book. Anyway, I, you know, I mean, like anything that I, I had a great ass and I, I made sure everybody knew it, you know. So I would flaunt that. And then when I heard myself sing finally at the Lollipop Lounge, I knew I had a great voice. I loved my voice on the microphone. That was the first time I ever heard myself on a microphone. And I loved it. 
I know to separate what's good and what's bad and then what I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can do that, which is what makes me a good producer for myself. I could step away. When I'm producing myself and I have an engineer in a room, which today I don't because I have Pro Tools. I do everything myself. Thank God. I was able to call myself the singer. That's the only way I could produce myself. I have to step away, which is very hard for females to do. I was the very first... I had a lot of pioneering things. I was the very first person to become an outside female producer. I was the very first. The Dead Boys, Ronnie Spector, um, you know, just, I was doing other people. I was, because I was on both sides of the glass. I was a good rock and roll producer. And, but when I'm producing myself, I'm able to turn around and say something like that to an engineer, like, bring the singer up a little bit more, or bring her down a bit, you know, and... He used to laugh at me. He goes, the singer is you. I said, I can't think that way. I can't think that way. I got to think about the record and where it belongs, you know. And that's the difference, you know. I pretty much know what I should sound like. The best, the best album I've done was the very first production I did, which was Urban Desire. And uh, anyway... Yes. <laughs> I just don't shut up, do I? No, this is great. Well, I think in sound bites too, like we do a lot of little promotional. Yeah, yeah, clips yeah, 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 yeah. This is great. This is great. <laughs> I never do anything. Like, it's, just, it's all weird. They cool. never go. I mean, I have guides, but it's really not. Like, nothing's set yeah. in stone. Oh, no, so no, this no. Is all, it, this is great. It, yeah, I never had a problem being interviewed, believe yeah, okay. me. No. Um, but, oh, actually. Well, I don't want to skip because you did the, so you heard yourself sing and then was that kind of the catalyst that you thought I have to be well, a fan? Well, remember the motorcycle guy, Ralph? Yeah. And, and 3,000 Miles on a Harley Davidson, what I did was sing pretty much a lot into his ear and he kept asking me to keep singing. Okay, in his ear. So I would sing things like, Earth Angel, Earth Angel, whoa. You know, and he just loved it, you know. So that was like two weeks of me singing in someone's ear. Heard myself on a tape that I had. This is after I got married to that rich Jewish guy. And uh, I had a, uh, a little tape deck that he had bought me. And um, I had, uh, I, I put on the doo-wops, and sang along with them onto the tape, and I heard myself, and I loved it, you know? So, I mean, my voice was my friend. It was, you know, something I liked doing, never thinking I could make money at it or thinking, you know, that that's going to become my, my career, never thinking that until, you know, um, well, until later, yeah. But cheesecake modeling came pretty much after that. So... Uh, I was in Playboy magazine, I was in Nugget magazine, and, you know, um, making a hundred bucks an hour in the 58, yeah. that was a lot of fucking money. That was where, a where lot of... Where were you living when you were making... I was living in Brooklyn with this girl, Chicky, where I had left Jew boy. <laughs> I could say that because I'm Jewish. <laughs> I left Rich Jew Boy again, second time, because he says, I'll find you an apartment. When I was broke, California, and I needed money to get there, and he had hoped this, you know, this was going to rekindle us. <laughs> boy, oh boy, was he wrong. Anyway, um, do you know why I left him? Because he tried to rape me one night. Mm -hmm. and, my, and he said, this is not rape. I'm your husband. He says, and I could have you any time I want. And at that time, he's right. There was no law. If you're married and, this, and he forces you, you know. So I knew I had to get the fuck out of there. He was frustrated. I don't blame him, you know. I mean, he loved me. So he, I think he loved, who knows what love is? Who knows what love is? I don't know anymore. I think love is getting up and singing, you know. Anyway, um. So not really the nice guy. Not, you know, and then my father found out that I never consummated that marriage. You should have seen the smile on his face. I think he wanted me to die a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I think my father thought I was screwing around when I was eight. Yeah. Honestly. 
I think so. I don't know. They thought the worst of me. Um, my mother said, oh, here's my mother's sex talk to me. You want to hear what she said to me <laughs> when she found out I didn't sleep with him? She goes, I didn't want to sleep with father either. <laughs> you have to sleep with him. <laughs> He's your husband. You have to sleep with him. I said, you sleep with him. You're the one that wanted me to marry him. You sleep with him. <laughs> Anyway, um, so yeah, so I come back from California, broke as a church mouse. He has an apartment for me in some house down in the basement. And he thinks he's going to be seeing me and I go, divorce. Annulment, really, that's what I had. So I'm not even, it's an annulment, it's not a divorce. Annulment because we never consummated the marriage. So, you know, anyway. So, um, anyway, it's not on record that I was married to him, you know, so, uh, but anyway, um, so that was done, and um, next thing I know is I'm sitting with Chicky in a, an Italian pizza place, and this guy comes over, very well dressed, and I thought, what the fuck does he want, you know, I still wanted my boys on motorcycles, you know, and I wanted, you know, I wanted Marlon Brando, you know? And uh, he comes over and he goes, I was looking at your neck. <laughs> he says, you have a beautiful long neck. I went, really? Really? Thank you. <laughs> we continue to eat. He goes, look, I'm a photographer. And he gives me a card. And he's a photographer. He goes, uh, I would love to photograph you. I'll give you a couple of dollars. Well, that's all I had to hear. I didn't know anything about cheesecake modeling. I thought, this guy really liked my neck and he wants to take pictures of <laughs> You want to talk? I didn't know shit. I still didn't know nothing and I still don't. <laughs> if someone came over to me today and said, I love your foot, I would love to photograph your foot for a couple of bucks. I go, yeah. Okay. I, okay. Where do I meet you? <laughs> anyway, um, I met him. And of course, it started very easy. You know, face, you know, oh, beautiful. Oh, beautiful, 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 beautiful. Yes. Do you, you want to open that top up a little bit? You know, just to show a little, you know, I went, sure. Open it up. <laughs> that was the session and he gave me $70. I thought, holy shit, I hope he calls me again. He did. So I got slowly to know him and slow, he was very smart, okay? He didn't touch me, never touched me. It's amazing, he was a voyeur. That's, you know, that's what he had to be. He was a pilot, by the way. That was his real living, a pilot. So he um, calls me, and now this is about fourth, fifth time. Now it's, he says, listen, I'd like to give you a hundred bucks an hour, but I need for you to open your top more. And I thought, mm, I'll give you a hundred dollars. I'm gonna hundred. Start opening it up. It's open. By the end of that session, I had my top off. That was it. Great. A hundred bucks. Now this happened quite a few times. I brought my friend Chicky into this. She was making a hundred bucks an hour. This was like, you know, we're teenagers and we're making $100 an hour in the late 50s. This is unheard of. That's like you getting $1,500 a week, you know? Now, it's like me and Chickie are running wild. This is great. Next thing we know, we get uh, asked to do some classes, some photo classes for photo photographers, you know? with just our panties on. I had a great body, so I didn't care. And I would go with just my panties on. And so with Chicky, and so we used to do all of that. These guys, these classes, they're only like sick fucks, you know? They just want to see, they're hoping that you can get away with seeing something. That's all they are, you know? And so I was making good money all over the place. And I called myself, what was, I, I even have, I called myself, Terry Marlowe, and I even was in the post. New, uh, a new model, Terry Marlowe, posing for, and that was the first time I was ever in the paper. Yeah. 
So I was starting to be someone in my nakedness. <laughs> and then I met Shel Silverstein. You got to look him up. He's 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 dead now. We did uh, we went to a um, me Chicky and him. We went to uh, a nudist colony for a photo shoot for Playboy, and I was afraid to come out of. The, I didn't want to come out of the tent, but Shell was a heavy guy. He came out. I went, oh shit! Who the hell wants to see this? You know, and I was still working on not being a virgin. You know, and I mean, he turned me off. It was enough to make me gay then. You know, and so, and then Chicky comes out, and then I see families with children walking around naked. I go. Well, if Shell could come out like that, then I could. I came out. Now, my father has a candy store, and he's got magazines like Playboy. All right? And I said to Shell, I said, Shell, the only thing you could do is photograph my ass on mats and stuff like that. You can't photograph me in the front. My father will see it. This is a shoot for Playboy, you know? And he said, fine. You know my sister recognized my ass? <laughs> I swear to God, she recognized my ass. She goes, I got to get those magazines out of there. Look at you. Look at you. Oh, my God. How did you know it was me? Look at your hair. Look at your ass. Of course I know that's you. That's you. <laughs> no, I know. Then, I while, while I had Goldie and the gingerbreads, Margot Margo comes into the back room and she goes, look at this. This is terrible. Boom. And she lands this magazine. I'm on it. The... I'm on the cover of a detective magazine sitting with stockings and a gun in my stocking, sitting there like a gun mall, my tits hanging out. She goes, look at this. This could ruin us. I said, or it could make us. <laughs> it didn't ruin us. <laughs> so, yeah, they were funny stories. Yeah. Mm hmm yeah. And like nothing bad happened to you. Nothing because... bad happened to me except when I was a little girl. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, on Grand, when we first came through Ellis Island, the stopover place was Grand Street, and this neighbor uh, used to put me on his lap and hurt me. Mm -hmm. That was that was bad. Yeah. And I never told my parents. When I had cancer, I never told my mother. It's like telling them would make it my fault. Mm -hmm. It's really pathetic. You know, well, but anyway. Yeah. I forgive her now. She's, you know, I forgive her. Yeah. I forgive her. She, later on in life, she, I'll never forget this. I was living on 57th Street. It was right during 10 Wheel Drive. Maybe it was after 10, mm -hmm. it was after 10 Wheel Drive. And she turned around to me in my living room and she said, I wasn't a good mother, was I? That was the very first time that she ever admitted that she fucked up. That was heavy. That was so fucking heavy. I, 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 I was in shock. I, I didn't know what to say to her. But I said to her, you did the best you could. What else could I say to her? You know, it was done. It was done. Yeah. Just to hear her say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, since I don't even really want to ask any very direct questions because you're saying so, just so many things and stories. That I am expecting. saying a lot. I know. Um, yeah, but if you could just talk a little bit. You, you did mention um, Ginger. Mm -hmm. uh, but just sort of, ha I don't know if you want to talk about the escorts, but how you did you intend for Goldie? Did you intend to form an all girl no, band? No, no. Okay. When I found Ginger, and I and, and I met her during a gig at Trudy Heller's in the Greenwich Village with the escorts. Okay, um, when I when I saw her and I heard her, I went, "That's the hardest thing to get a chick to play drums." This is the 60s. Mothers would want their kids to play piano, girls, piano, violin. Drums? Get out of here. You know, what mother is going to get a snare drum for her kid? You know, I mean, come on. So, well, today, yeah, not then. 
So to me, uh, Ginger, well, first we befriended each other. I don't know if she told you, she ran away from home and came and moved into my place after I befriended her. And uh, With her monkey, she said. With her monkey. It was the funniest <laughs> fucking thing. Did she tell you about Beaumont almost raping me? She didn't say rape, but she said that he would, like, fondle you. <laughs> fondle me? He was laying on my chest. Okay, I took him out of the cage. He's laying on my chest, and he never took his eyes off my eyes and started to unbutton my shirt. And I'm looking at Beaumont, and he's looking at me. I'm going, oh, no, you don't. And I grabbed him and stuck him in the cage. And I was, I didn't want to even go back to, into the living room to look at him. This monkey was like a real dude laying on me. It was like the weirdest thing. And I said to her, I said, you know, Beaumont was opening my shirt. She said, well, you do have nice tits. <laughs> I said, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, that was Beaumont. We used to take Beaumont to restaurants, too. Yeah, it was very cool then. I mean, nobody really complained. They didn't say... It said no dogs allowed, but yeah, they didn't say like very, no monkeys allowed, you know? <laughs> she just very casually mentioned a monkey yeah. when she ran away. I was like, wait, oh, a real monkey? She's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, a monkey. My oh, monkey yeah. and I was monkey. in an apartment where no animals were allowed. I had a bird and I had a dog from, from Richard Perry yeah. Escorts who gave me that pug. So I had, and, and there were, somebody called the police and I, I hid the dog and the bird into the closet and uh, Beaumont went into another closet and cops come up and here we are, you know, two young girls and, and uh, the cops are like almost flirting with us. I said, there's a complaint that you have animals. I said, ha, ha, animals. And all of a sudden you hear, ha, ha, ha. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I said that. Okay. So one of the cops go, go into the bedroom and looks in the closet and he calls the other cop. He goes, you're not going to believe this. They got a fucking monkey. <laughs> But did they let you keep it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought so. Yeah, I offered them a beer and they couldn't do it. I said, you want some pasta? They went, no. Thank you. Don't worry about the bitch downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> they went. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the 60s. The hysterical <laughs> stuff. But yeah, uh, the escorts was the introduction because I had a number one record with them. And uh, I remember the company calling me up while I'm working with, um, I'm getting Goldie and the Gingerbreads company calling me up saying you got a number one record and uh you got to go do some record hops in detroit and parts of ohio and canada i went what the fuck is a record hop you know and that was my introduction yeah so i got introduced on top so to speak you know with a number one record yeah and um a lot of funny stories in that but she says, we'd be here uh, for three weeks. <laughs> so um, then, you know, when I had Ginger, I said, okay, now comes the easy part. Wrong. Find rockers was a hard thing, you know. Uh, even Margot, who we wound up with, was, was more of a jazz musician and uh, had to come around to the style of playing that I wanted, you know. But she was so good uh, that she could do anything. It's just a matter of getting her to do it, you know, and, and uh, she did. And that was the final four, you know. It was me, Carol, who, who was not easy to get into the band either because she was starting her solo career. I mean, think about it. She wanted to sing too. And I was a singer in the band, and that's the way it was going to be, you know. So, uh, but she came in, and um, we had our final four. Yeah. We also had five at one time, but the girl got pregnant, Nancy. When I did the Carson show, I told the story about that. And uh, Nancy uh, was living at the hotel where we were playing. We, you know, when you used to do a gig in those days, you'd do it for four or five weeks at a time. You wouldn't do one-nighters. Yeah. And it was a club. You did four shows, five shows a night, sometimes six. <laughs> That's why I have to laugh when people say, I'm getting hoarse. I sang five times. Or, Try getting brought up in club scenes, honey. Yeah, yeah, you know. But anyway... Um, yeah, uh, she, and we were managed by the mob at the time, and I can't tell you his name, because he's still alive, and he just got out of prison, actually. Do the math. Do some Googling. <laughs> oh, 
It's yeah. outside, walking on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're coming up here. It looks like he's in a limo and uh, he's got four guys behind him. <gasps> Don't talk my name. Anyway. How uh, did you meet mob guys to meet? Oh, the honey, band? the clubs were owned by mobs. Oh, okay. They knew who Goldie and the Gingerbreads were. You kidding? We were so hot, you know. I mean, I mean, we 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 were hired by the elite to play parties. I mean, it was just. And this was even before you were signed to a major major label. Absolutely, or, yeah. absolutely. We made more money by not being signed. Yeah. <laughs> we used to do a gig, like the Air Force bases and, and and all of that. Okay. Come back. I used to be able to buy a car. That's how much money we made. Then we became stars. We were lucky if we saw a hundred dollars. We were being ripped off by everybody that joined us, you know? It was terrible, terrible. Yeah. Um, and in your book, you say that it was easy to get gigs or get booked. Because we were women. Because you were, but, it, but it was difficult to be taken seriously. As Until they heard us play. Okay. Yes. When they heard us play, they knew they were dealing with something... Because if you closed your eyes, there's no way on earth you would have thought those were women. You know, Ginger had a foot. I used to call her Thunderfoot. You know, she and her, she was a great rock player, great rock player. Uh, Margot, incredible keyboards with bass pedals on her Hammond organ. Mm. Come on, you know, what chick is out there doing that even today? Uh, Nancy, when she was playing bass, the one that got pregnant, she was, I called her Thunder Thumb. Guys couldn't believe this big sound that came out of this very, very feminine girl. Yeah. She'd get on stage, go, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> she'd go, Hannah, yes, we, could, we have a gig there. She was very, very girly. Then she'd get on stage and go, boom, 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 boom. It's just so weird. And then we had Dora Dyke in the band. We had, I called her Dora Dyke. She walked like she had 14 Tampax between her legs. Oh, people I used to tell me that. I, no, she, listen, I'm not going to tell you her name. We had to walk through the audience for her to get to stage. So even if you don't get this on camera, I got to show you what she walked like. Yeah, <laughs> I used to say to her, would you do me a favor? Would you walk like a fucking chick? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I said, you look like a truck driver in drag. Stop walking like that. I'm trying. Then she had a broken tooth, too. So I said, don't smile. People love Mystique, which Mystique wasn't happening then. Smiles were, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, if this isn't a comedy movie, I don't know what is, but uh, with tragedy, of course. But anyway. So, yeah, so the, the mob was, um, had booked us in Vegas. And we were coming up to doing a big gig when Nancy got pregnant. Abortions were not legal. So then you needed a bass player. What did, how did, what did you do? When you I just said, it? okay, Margo's going to use her bass pedals. That's it. We're not getting a bass player. Okay. It'll be the four of us. And that's how we went to Europe. Yeah. You know, we went to UK. We were working the wagon wheel at the time without Nancy. And, um, and House of the Rising Sun was number one by the animals. And uh, apparently they were in town. And they were in Times Square. That's where the Wagon Wheel and Pep Mint Lounge was, which is where we were. And uh, Mike Jeffries, who was their manager, Eric Burden, and, and Hilton Valentine were walking down the street, and they thought we were black. They didn't even know that this was a girl's band. They heard a tambourine, which I was a tambourine queen, mm -hmm. singing doo-wop songs and black songs by Mary Wells and, you know, all of the, all the good R&B stuff. You know, we weren't writing then. We were doing, we were a cover band, you know, doing all the songs that the audience wanted and, uh, and playing them well. And, uh, and, and so Eric goes, oh, oh, good. It's like a gospel group. Let's go in. They go in and they're in absolute shock. Not only was this a girls band, a white girls band. They flipped. Next thing I know is Mike Jeffries corners me and he goes, 
I want to bring you over to England. And, you know, we weren't going much further in the States. You know what I mean? We were on Atlantic Records, but we weren't going much further. And the English invasion was started, okay? Between the Beatles and uh, the Animals and uh, all of the, you know, the Kinks, it was starting. And so I said, and a lot of groups, a lot of people did that, you know, including the Pretenders, you know, Chrissy Hines moved to England because of that. Because they didn't accept us here that way, that big. Uh, you know, everything in UK was done through uh, PR, the music magazines. So we were in the papers every freaking day. We went over there. We went over there. We signed. We went over there. It wasn't just like overnight. It's, it's a big story with it. But, you know, anyway, we went over there and we were huge. We would have the hot seat in front of the Stones. Hot seat meaning there'd be six acts. And normally they have six acts. People start screaming for the main act. We had the hot seat because they didn't scream for the main act because they were so excited about us that nobody screamed, Stones, you know, nobody did that. K Kinks, Hollies, whatever. So we toured with the best of them. And all of these groups used to stand uh, by the curtains when we, we perform and just, we blew them away. We blew them away. We were huge there. And then we wind up cutting this white piano song that I hated, mm -hmm. Can't You Hear My Heartbeat? Because I was more into the black music than that. And uh, I wasn't into the Supremes uh, per se, but they wanted me to sing it like the Supremes. And I went, we're not the Supremes. We're R&B. I was shocked that they didn't really understand that, you know, but that became our hit. And Herman's Hermits covered it as well. And they had a hit with it in the States. We had a hit with it over there. We would have wanted it the other fucking way around, but Anyway. Um, oh, wait, I'm trying to think. Yeah, but when I was talking to Ginger, I, if I'm remembering correctly, she said that was kind of the beginning of, like, the, the demise or the dissolution of the... It was a demise because they were jealous that my name was in the paper all the time. Oh, Okay. Okay. She said it Let, was the, like the, the single that it never really took off in the States and it was... It coupled with everything. Okay. I'll tell you what the problem was, okay? My, this is exactly what happened. Newspapers there, the music papers, never, they, they, the headlines couldn't be long, okay? You know how the headlines are usually shortened, like they'll, they'll J-Lo... Instead of saying, you know, uh, the full names or whatever. Goldie to appear at such and such place. Goldie to appear. And I believe it really irked the girls. And I'll never forget that. And I used to say to them, well, I'm thinking to it myself, if, if the Stones would have felt that way about Mick, because they'd say, Mick to appear on Ready, Steady, Go. Mick to do, you know. They would, they would always find the front person that they talked to, mostly, mostly, you know. When the record did hit there, okay, we could have gone on to do better and bigger things. What happened was the hotter we got, the demise started. And this happens to a lot of groups, and I'll never figure that shit out. I will never understand that. You know, because I, when I spoke to Bill Weinman... I said, how did you feel about Mick's name being up there for everything? He goes, we're happy that there's a star in the group because if we stick together long enough, we'll all be stars. Now that was the right way to think. You know, that was the right way to think. I really believe that that was what was irking Margot and what was irking Ginger. Okay? I don't know how Carol felt about it. You know, I don't think she was that... I call that petty, but it's okay, you know. I love Ginger. Yeah. You know, Ginger is my my sole partner. You know, I loved her and I still love her. And um 
you know, it's it's just very weird that they didn't treat this as a business. You have to treat this as a business because it's a big money industry. If you don't treat this like business, you're going to break up. Okay? Like, for example, on my radio show, I play Goldie and the Gingerbreads. Little Steven plays Goldie and the... I'm keeping Goldie and the Gingerbreads as live as much as I can. Now we got a CD finally coming out of Goldie and the Gingerbreads. Uh, when I got in touch with the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they were doing a thing on women in rock. This woman knew my whole career, and she said, would you come down and do an interview for the whole career? And I said, of course. She didn't say, could you bring the rest of the gingerbreads? Could you bring ginger? Could you do this? Could you do that? I went down there, and I gave them my sweatshirt that says Goldie and the Gingerbreads, gave them a, a couple of posters that say Goldie and the Gingerbreads. They were very happy. But the interview was about me. What we're doing now, me coming to the United States, how did I start with music? I've got it on film. It's a fabulous interview. And I was pushing the gingerbreads as much as I was talking about my life and 10 wheel drive and my solo career and how did you get to the dead boys? So it was really all about my career. Yeah. Marco turns around and says, I know why you didn't ask Ginger. This is not that long ago. And I haven't talked to her since. I know why you didn't ask Ginger, because you want all of the glory. And I said, you're the reason this group broke up. And I don't care if this is on film. Yeah. Okay? Well, no, I mean, I'm staring at you because I'm thinking that I think the responsibility lies more with the people who do the documenting, you know, like journalists and historians. And yeah. Document. Like I yeah. sat down and did a full, the same interview yeah. with Ginger. Yeah. But people, but you're a front person. Front, yeah. People who front bands tend to When you talk to the, the Stones, even till this day, yeah. it's Mick, Mick, Mick. Or but Keith. what's co- Or Keith. Keith. Well, Keith. now it's coming to Keith. Keith is finally, I mean, in the last, I'd say 20 years, Keith is now as much as a star as, as Mick. Because they stayed together long enough. They've yeah. been through it. If Ginger just kept her mouth shut, sh- <laughs> there would have been a lot more happening, okay? And Margot especially. I, I, it just, there's a lot of personal shit, you know, which I'm not going to get into yeah. uh, because we don't have to. But for her to have said that to me, it was like, what, four years ago? And I haven't talked to her since. You know, it broke my heart that she said that. And then it hit me. You are the reason this group broke up. For you to say that when they want to talk about my life, what's Ginger supposed to do on this panel? When they're talking about 10 Wheel Drive, when they're talking about the Dead Boys, when they're talking about me coming to the United States, when they're talking about my solo career, when they're talking about my productions, when they're talking about the film CBGBs, when they're talking about my play, what are you, what is Ginger going to do? You know, they wanted, so for her to have said that, it's typical of what they will feel. And that reiterated my thoughts anyway. This is what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a shame because Goldie and the Gingerbreads could have been huge. We were huge there, but we could have really, really been huge. Mm. Wrong choices, wrong things, you know. What can I say? I am I went on. I mean, I, I'm happy with my life today. You know, I'm happy with what I'm doing. Little Steven, he's wonderful. Yeah. He's great to work with. You know, uh, my play is being done by, by, you know, my documentary is being done. Here I am sitting with you. I mean, you know, my feeling is like my career is my business. And my singing is my love, you know? But I have to treat this like, you know, like anything else. But I have to be real. And I, you know, that's what I try to do. Um, The guy that's putting out the gingerbread record, uh, the Goldie and the Gingerbreads record, he says, I'm reading your book. He says, I can't believe how candid you are. He says, you're just the way you talk. And I said, yeah. Well, who else am I going to be? This is what I know. I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not, you know? 
after the gingerbreads, did you do ten wheel drive or did the producing come first? Like what it what did you no, plan to no, do? No, I and... did I did um I knew that I wanted to uh expand in music, you know, so I had uh I had met this jazz drummer. Uh, it was a great step for me because that's how I could have a, a group like Ten Wheel. I went into a straight jazz quintet, Les Dumero, uh, incredible drummer. Um, and, you know, I had my first charts done and everything by Frank Foster, who's a big name in big bands. And uh, so I learned a lot about jazz. Um, but I, they loved it because I put that rock into their jazz, you know, so it was like a mixture of things. That's when, after that, came Ten Wheel Drive, you know. I, God, I've, I've reinvented myself so many times, you know. Um, so, but the jazz thing was for me to learn, you know, and uh, you can't learn it if you're not singing it and you're not around it, and I was around it, and I met the Brecker brothers, and they became, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, and shit like that, you know. I mean, like, you know, my steps were perfect. I was at the right time, at the right place, all the time, yeah. you know, all the time. And uh, always fighting to be, not fighting, but always managing, I should say, to be the first in a lot of shit, you know. So, okay, so then started 10 Wheel Drive, and um, these guys were college dudes and studied music, and I was like street, you know, and uh, they fell in love with the sound. So they would write songs that sounded like a play on Broadway, and I would take it and funkify it. And it worked, you know, it worked. The combination was incredible. And we did three albums together. I, I was the one that did all the firing, because they couldn't. I used to love firing uh, the horn sections. They were such chauvinists. Sh oh. Chauvin, you say. I used to say, would you want me to sit on the side of the stage like the old days where they have the singer sit there while you're playing? Yeah. Well, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, very chauvinistic they are, especially jazzers, horn players. Yeah. They couldn't stand that I would start their solo with my hand and end it with my hand. They I was, all guys? Yeah. All oh, yeah. No, yeah. No women. Yeah. No women. I had enough women, thank you, then. Oh, so my that God. was a deliberate choice after the... Oh, absolutely, but alive. man, did I miss my sisters. Yeah. Oh, did I miss them. There's nothing like being close to, to your girlfriends. They were my girlfriends. You know, they were my sisters. They were... I loved them. All of them. I loved them. You know? We were so fucking tight. It just... it. it we were a family. We could have an argument, and by the end of the set, we'd have an argument before we were on a stage, by the end of the set we'd be hugging each other because it was all through music. It was so fucking good that we forgave any kind of arguments. You know what I'm saying? It was just, we were tight. Was we your were tight. relationship? And you can't have order? that with guys. There's yeah. no way you'll be that close to you guys. You know? No way. This is sort of random, but I forgot to ask it earlier. Um, and it's probably kind of a boring question, but I'm curious. Were you ever able to make a living playing in bands, like playing in Ten Wheel Drive, playing in Goldie and the Gingerbreads? Did you have to support yourself in other ways or work other jobs? No. And both those bands were on major labels? Both, both, both those bands, I had enough money to live on, yes. Okay. Yes, not. I didn't have to do cheesecake modeling if that's what you're asking. We'll get a job. No, no, no. Yeah. My, my every income I ever had was through music. Yeah, that was my living. Or else, what was the sense? I had to live. I wasn't. You know, when I when I started singing, I didn't go like you know. Uh, oh, I want to be a star. I went okay. How do I make money now? It was all about money. You know. Yeah. Did you really, did you, well, you said that you feel most comfortable on stage. Yes. Performing. Yes. Um, did that, does that change depending on what band you're playing in or who you're performing with? Or is no, because once I'm up there singing, I'm into me yeah. and I'm singing, you know? Yeah. 
like 10 wheel drive didn't think they were ready i said we're doing the film more we're not ready you're ready we're doing the film more and we were a smash yeah yeah um and then how long did that band last it, because then you met clive davis and you were clive signed. davis was the beginning of my demise oh okay mm -hmm. i don't know anything about this okay so. Clive dropped me because I was not his next Janis Joplin. Okay. Um, when I did my first solo album for Clive, I was like an animal that was let loose because after 10 Wheel Drive and doing charts and not having the freedom to do songs the way I wanted, because once it's in the charts, you have to kind of go with the chart. And I'm a club singer, I'm a, I'm a bar singer, and I like to pull songs and have tags go for a while. You know what that's like. Stay on it, man. That's how I got Janis Joplin to come up and sing with me. That's how I got a lot of people to come up and sing with me. They have to stay on it. And it was a fight all the way because the horn players couldn't, five of them couldn't play without a chart, you know, so they'd have to stand there and make believe they were enjoying it. So, you know, and here I am, and I'm a, I'm a club singer. I can extend the song to an hour with a tag. I'm a singer. I can make up lyrics. I could, you know, that's what I do. And um, so once I was let loose, it's Clive, in a way, was right. You know, he said that album was, it went in so many different directions. Well, that was because it was my first album. Had he stuck with me like most, uh, you know, most companies do. Look, look, okay, for example, Mary Ann Faithful. She's on Island Records with Chris Blackwell. He could have dropped her nine million times because she didn't have hit records. He didn't because he believes in her. Clive Davis obviously did not believe in me. That's how I felt. Okay, so when he dropped me, my drinking started real bad. That was the beginning of a fall for me. Until Urban Desire, when I produced my own album. And I was producing a lot of people at the time. Um, a lot of unknowns. I, was, I had to learn my, my craft better, so I didn't mind doing demos for people. And then I met Hilly Crystal, the owner of CBGB's. Mm -hmm. And uh, he truly believed in me. Uh, he was one of the first few, and so did the guy at RCA Records. He totally believed in me, which is why he had me produce a couple of groups for him. Um, Mike Berniker. But Hilly Crystal, the owner of CBGB's, he totally believed in me. I was doing demos for the Miamis, for the Shirts, for the, for the uh, Manster, and uh, you know all the groups there. And then he calls me and he goes, I, I have this group. He says, I think... I think they've got something. And when, when Hilly says that, he saw enough bands go through CBGBs that, you know. So I went down and the Dead Boys are on stage. And he leans over to me and goes, they're kind of charming, aren't they? And I went, charming? They're singing Everyone Knows You Were Caught With The Meat In Your Mouth. What is charming about this? Stiv is spitting, scratching his balls. <laughs> Cheetah looks like a fucking orange flower, you know? <laughs> you know, they're all, and there's no bass player. And I went, rock and roll without a bass? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I said, uh, let me think about it. So I meet the guys, and Stiv knew who I was, because he was a real rock and roll junkie. And, uh, so I wound up producing them. And we went into Electric Ladyland where I got a great deal to take them in to do a demo. There is no demo. You know what a demo is when you're sitting in the living room? If you're going to do a demo, do you, do you play less? No. Yeah. Do you sing less? No. I had the microphones. I had the engineers, which I fired about three of them because they weren't giving me what I wanted. Uh, then I got Bob Clearmountain. He gave me what I wanted. Not only that, Bob Clearmountain is the bass player on the first uh -huh. CD, the first Dead Boys. And they never gave him credit until he worked with the Stones. Then they went, did he, did he mix anything? I went, he didn't mix anything. I mixed it, you fucking asshole. I was the one that mixed it. I hired him. You didn't want to know who he was until he 
you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> How did you fall into that, though? Was it uh, into producing for other bands? I was living across the street from Media Sound, which was the main uh, recording studio in New York City. Everybody that was anybody was recording there. I lived across the street. So I befriended a couple of uh, engineers, one of them being Harvey Goldberg, Bob Clear Mountain, and let me see, uh, Godfrey Diamond, and all of those guys, uh, the baby engineers that came out of there that, hit, that had hit record after hit records, the engineers. And uh, so I spent a lot of time in the studio with the engineers. I asked a lot of questions, especially to Harvey. He was really good to me, you know. He would answer everything. He was the one that did uh, worked with a lot of people, like also Keith, and and uh, he worked with um, Sly and Family Stone, and, and, and I mean, um, Cool and the Gang, and so you know, I mean, like anyway, um, how did I start? Slowly by by bringing people in on demos because I could get off time at Media Sound because I lived across the street, and when they were dead studio time, there'd be nobody in there. The owners allowed me to, they were so good to me. Um, they allowed me to come in there if I found my own engineer, and Harvey said yes. So I'd start doing it that way, and then eventually I got paid for it, you know, and eventually I started to get called for it. And then eventually I met Hilly Crystal, who, you know, I produced for. And um, did you see the movie, CBGB's? I haven't seen it yet, no. Okay, that's interesting. No. Yeah. Uh, Stana Kadik does a good Genya Raven. Okay. She does. I, was I wanted her to, to say, it. fuck better. Yeah. But, yeah, she did good. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it easy? Don't be afraid of seeing it. Yeah, yeah. Don't be afraid. I, I was afraid of being disappointed. I know, I know. Sorry. Look at it like, you know, who did it? I, I yeah. mean, you know. It's okay. It was okay. Anyway, so. Um, in between all of this, you know, I sang for the Warriors, the movie The Warriors. I sang that. And, and also did uh, a lot of touring with Sly and the Family Stone on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, your Raven Band. And I still have the same drummer. Oh, He's yeah? He's working on the stuff. I'm going to play your track after. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. See, these are perks. <laughs> huh? <laughs> these are the perks of the job. Yeah. yeah the perks. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you... You were, I mean, you're the, I don't want to say the first because I'm not sure. The I was the first, the first to, I was the first to do outside band. Chicks were producing themselves. Yeah. But they weren't producing other okay. rock bands. So I was the first one that we know of. Yeah. Okay. That was it. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah, I'm well, I don't know if you could if you could just talk I don't know like what is most important or pertinent to you so you were producing and touring in the 70s and 80s I wasn't um, touring that much anymore in the late 7 well 78 I did the Urban Desire album we got signed to 20th Century Fox and we did tour a lot mm -hmm. so I wasn't producing then I was producing myself which I was happy about okay after that, I started my own label, which I called Polish Records, and I had T-shirts that said, "Who do I fuck to get off this label?" And everybody do you have any loved of those it. T-shirts? Huh? Yeah. Do you have any of those T-shirts? I wish I did. No, I don't. I don't. All the DJs loved it, and I used to send out little jock straps that had support Polish Records. <laughs> so Polish and po yeah, I loved Stiff Records. Yeah. So I, I based my label polish is really polish and then in the front we'd have a girl bending over and she says polish is no joke polish is no joke and in the back it said who do i fuck to get off this label <laughs> so everybody fucking loved that that was the big hit the djs loved it and i put ronnie specter on that i put manster on that i put el futuro on that put a lot of bands on that and that should have been called cocaine records because my partner was a dealer and that's where we got our money from. And uh, it was all part of the demise, baby. Mm -hmm. It was all part of that whole thing, getting dropped and feeling like shit. Because I think if Clive would have held me on for one more album, I think I would have given him what he wanted. 
not another Janis Joplin, no. but a rock record, because that would have been the Urban Desire album, which made so much noise. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, can you talk about how you kind of got out of that, and you said you've been clean, sober for 20 uh, since twenty uh, since nineteen ninety, uh, yeah. So all through the eighties was that not was a great eighties was nightmare. I yeah. and the end of the eight. Well, this is when I moved upstate and became a full time drunk and druggy. Um, I knew I had to make some sort of change, and uh, I really should have gone to a rehab, but. I, I, it took me a long time to get sober. It took me a very long time because my dealer lived right in town. She was like, she, <laughs> leave it to me to move to a country and find a dealer. <laughs> anyway, um, I found out at the end of the 80s that I had lung cancer. And Albany Med, where I went to, said, uh, I should get my life in order because, um, you know, I was third stage and basically they were telling me I was going to die. Yeah. I really say that my strength, it came from that whole growing up thing that I said, and it's in my song too. I said to this doctor, I said, are you God? And he goes, no, I'm just, I'm a doctor. What, what nobody tells me when it's over. And, and I said, I'm going to get a second opinion. He goes, I respect that. I went, good. And I called my sister. I was crying. It was the end, you know. And I remember saying in the car while I was crying, because we all know we're going to expire, but you don't come with an expiration date, you know. I remember saying in the car in, to myself, in the back, I was crying my eyes out. I said, well, to myself, I may as well get fucked up, okay. And then a little voice, I'll never forget this. That's my AA voice, because I already had a little AA in me, said, okay, you want to go out in the light or you want to go out in the dark? And I chose light. I didn't pick up through all of the chemos and everything else. And Sloan Kettering saved my life. And they still remember me. That's how funny I used to be. Including going through the throwing up and turning yellow from the chemo. They still didn't know if I was going to make it, but they were very aggressive. And here I am to talk about it, okay? So I used to curse so much. I had a roommate one time that had crosses all over her room. Oh, no. <laughs> and I went, I'm fucking hungry. I'm fucking hungry. They didn't feed me. They didn't, yeah. When the fuck was God? And every, and every time I cursed, she'd go. She'd, <laughs> the next thing I know is they're wheeling her out. Well, the people on that floor was the 11th floor. They loved me so much. The, the nurses and the doctors, they never forgot me. Um, they said I was so funny. Doctor would come in and went, I don't like your platelet count. And I went, what about my forklets and my knifelets? <laughs> what do you mean I'm a plate? You know? And uh, he'd look at me like, she's out. She's out there, you know. And... Um, then they had this rabbi visit me, and I said to the rabbi, I said, how could, how could anybody believe in God? How could anybody believe in God? I said, you guys, I said, you realize how many Jews died? And he says, that's man-made, that's not God-made. I went, whoops, he's right. Anyway, so back to, yeah, I didn't pick up a drink. I didn't pick up anything. And I had a dream that I wanted to take my dog, whose name was Yo-Yo at the time, and take him to Florida and to see my mother and my sister because I came very close to death. And I, my sister, my God bless and rest her soul, she came right up to New York 
and stayed with me through this whole thing. And my brother-in-law, they put up their house for a loan for me to have a place in the city. To, and I said, no, no, I'll stay with this sick fucking fan. I stayed with her. Um, anyway. You stayed with a fan? I stayed with a fan. She was, uh, I knew her for years and uh, she had a big thing for me and I stayed with a fan. A crazy yeah. fucking fan. She's crazy. But you made it. Huh? You I survived. made it. I made it. I couldn't wait to get away from her. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. I had to make it. I had to get away from her. <laughs> That seems like a big part of your story, too, is, like, getting away from people. Constantly. The motorcycle guy. The everybody. Husband, everybody. The fan. Fans. <laughs> everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I... <laughs> so, well, you've, like, you've worked with a lot of people throughout your career. Right. Um, but you also seem to have made sure that you know exactly what you need to do in order to, like, take care of yourself and be able to depend on yourself. Like that seems survival, like part honey. of the, That's like learning of, how to produce. So absolutely. Then you don't have to, so I don't have to deal with the a-holes. But so why do you bother dealing with people at all or like working with anyone? Because you know how to do everything. Because um, sometimes you want that input. Yeah. Sometimes you need the A-being, you know, the, what do you think? You know, like, um, if I don't like the answer, I'm not going to listen anyway. But, you know, I still, you know, where, like, sometimes I'll be mixing my, my record, like, here. Like, I'll play for you in a bit. And I'll say to myself, if I had a fucking engineer, then I, you know, I could sit back and probably be more creative. And then I go, that's not true. Because I can do this myself. Do I have all the answers in engineering? No. I know that there are things I don't know how to do yet. And I keep asking John, my partner here, um, I got to do this, I got to do that, can you set me up? You know, so he'll do it. But, you know, I hate asking him. I'd rather have an engineer than say, okay, I want this to repeat right here. You know, I forgot how to get that to repeat. How do I get that to repeat? You know, so I'm stuck that way, but I'm doing plain old ass rock and roll, you know? I mean, like, you know, you don't need too many repeats. You know? <laughs> Just, just make it live and make it real, you know? Um, yes, well, there you've done a lot. So you've written a memoir. There was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, museum. Yep, the museum. Uh, yeah, you've been... You've received a lot of honors and, mm -hmm. and awards and... Things and like yet, that. I'm not a household name. Yes. Okay. Why? Little Steven <laughs> said on my liner note, which I love, if Genya Raven is not a household name, it is not her fault. I was climbing up the charts. My record company folded. Peter Sellers wanted me in a movie. My manager poo-pooed it because Lulu was going to sing. Uh, ten wheel drive, one hundred dollars a week was not enough for me. Okay, Goldie and the Gingerbreads, you already know about that. Um, it has nothing to do with talent. I have to tell you, for everything that I've done, there are people out there that do it better, and you don't know who they are either. So. What I have is respect from my peers. And that's hard to get. And I've got that. Which is why I'm still here. Popping up and getting awards. Because somebody somewhere said, Oh yeah, again you're Raven, yeah. You know? So my mission is accomplished. If, if um, you know, May Bell doesn't know who I am, that's, you know, that's not my fault. I'll take care of that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Um, I love that attitude. That's what this is. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you'll know. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm like I love shoving it. you all on stage <laughs> in different cities. <laughs> like, uh, um, well, so writing the memoir, I mean, I'm assuming that 
you have a really full and interesting life story. Was was a part of that a way to self-document or preserve your career too? That too, but you know what I call it? It's the fourth step from hell in AA. Because <laughs> yeah. you're really telling everything. I needed to put it down because... I didn't want to think about it anymore. It was more of a psychological thing for me. I started it not because somebody wanted it. Billboard books didn't, they didn't know about it. I mean, you know, I started to put it all down because I said, I'm going to write a book. And that's what I did. And then I got interest. And again, somebody walks into my life and starts rearranging shit. Okay. And again, you can't open with that and say fuck too many times. That's me. It's my book, not yours. You either want to publish it or you don't. I made a deal with them. They got it five years. After five years, I got it back. It's totally mine now. As Urban Desire is totally mine now. Oh, nice. Which is really cool, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of unheard of too, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's a law also that says anything that was done before... Uh, after 78 is yours, uh, if it's uh, 20 years or 30 years, I'm not sure. Urban Desire, and I mean it, they're both mine. Yeah. Um, okay, well, you, you kind of already answered this. There, these are just questions that I ask everyone at the end and, of every interview. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about your role in and contribution to rock history enormous I feel that what I've done is so important to all not just to women to all because I am a perfect example of if you want something work for it don't expect to get it handed to you when I get asked a question, how do I get into the music business? I want to throw up. Stop wanting to be in the music business and go on and do what it is that you want to do. Stop calling it, how do I get into the music business? How do I make a living in the music business? Work at it. How do I get in the music business? Work at it. I worked my ass off. You know? I, my contribution was enormous, okay, both for female artists and male artists. Look, for example, someone like Steve Bader's from the Dead Boys knew exactly who Goldie and the Gingerbreads were. You talk to any chick that I, that today that I play on my show on Chicks and Broads, all the little girl bands that are coming up now, they know Goldie and the Gingerbreads. This is important stuff, you know? And very few female producers, you know? And you can't take shit from people. No. You really can't. You gotta fight for every move that you get, you know? So my contribution, if I was any, which I think I was, is that if you want to rock, then rock. You want to be a doctor, go to school. You know, how do you become a star? Excuse me, I did a lot. I got a lot of awards and I'm not a star. I'm a star to certain people, you know, but if you want to, you know, star, I would hate to start today. I would hate to have started today because my school of music was getting up in bars and singing with different bands, which you don't have anymore. My, my learning music was singing other people's stuff, not locked up in a room doing just myself. My music school was playing with other musicians. My music school was doing five, six shows a fucking night for seven days a week. My music school was sounding like a guy the next morning because I was so hoarse from doing six shows, okay? Um, 
my music school, I worked. I didn't study dancing and change costumes every two seconds to become the next big star on MTV or whatever. I didn't do that. I worked my ass off. How do you become a star? Work your ass off. Make an offer that no one could refuse. <laughs> yeah. And um, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? Is there a gender discrepancy? Is gender not really an issue at all? Or is it something that has changed for better or worse since you started? Well, it's changed, but I don't think it's an issue at all. Matter of fact, I loved my issue in the 60s. I got paid more. <laughs> and then when we played, we got respected. What does that say to you? So, I had best of both worlds. Think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I like when somebody pulls out my chair. I like when somebody opens my door. I don't find it chauvinistic. They, they, you know, guys are guys and, and, and chicks are chicks, you know. I think guys are unfinished women. <laughs> no, I don't even say that. <laughs> no, isn't that... <laughs> God forgot to cut that thing off. <laughs> yeah. Everybody starts as women. Uh, huh? Everybody starts as women. I think guys just have an inherent thing where they want to fuck anything that walks, you know. And, and you know, so they're going to... Listen, I feel bad for the Hollywood people, but the, the women in Hollywood, because people like that guy, I mean, he would use his money and his... his um, how big he was, Weinstein, or whatever his name is, to get these girls to, to, to give him a blowjob or something, you know. That is sick. That's a chauvinist. I didn't have to give anybody a blowjob to work through the Ellers. <laughs> Never gave anybody a blowjob, period. I went through the 70s with no blowjobs. You don't have to put that in. I'm just saying. Even, no blowjobs. No blow ever. <laughs> ever. Get in no BJs. <laughs> Got to shorten it for the news. You need bumper no. stickers. <laughs> like, get you no BJs. Get you no saying. BJs. Don't make me laugh. That's hysterical. <laughs> That's hysterical. Yeah. Can you even no BJ's ever? I swear to you, I never gave a blow job, you. and I never will. I think it's disgusting. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's that great. How could it be great? It, I don't know. I mean, it's it's not disgusting. Really my thing at all. It's I've not my thing. I, I know <laughs> girls that like it. I said, don't ever kiss me hello. I have straight friends who, you know, they like really look. They're like, I love dick. I, love I can't <laughs> stand <laughs> the thought of that. Makes me <laughs> nauseous. I, I, you know, we shouldn't say that in front of her. But yeah, because no, I don't know. Maybe I she. I think you like you like dicks, don't you? Like not really. I love dicks. I love dicks. Yeah. I just don't want them in my mouth. To your face? No. Yeah. They seem gross. No, no. They I'm are glad gross. it's not just me. They're not pretty, okay? Yeah, they look yeah. disgusting. All right, I'm not going to... Stop it! The both of you, we and should balls. not go out to party together. Let balls. me tell you right now. We cannot go out to restaurants <laughs> I mean, or anything. Yeah. <laughs> I've gotten thrown out of restaurants in sobriety. <laughs> Oh, what, just for, like, things that you talk about in public? Oh, just loud. Yeah. Just oh, loud. Okay. <laughs> just, and then when we laugh, we really fucking laugh, you know. Anyway. Um, well, I mean, I, <laughs> this I probably shouldn't even ask you, because you host a radio show called Chicks and Broads. Right. So I get a lot of um, uh, questions and comments about the title of this project, which is Gendered, Women of Rock and Roll History Project. Yeah. But some people say we shouldn't have those categories at all and we're bullshit. all the same. Bullshit, and, okay. bullshit, Okay, because my question was, how do you feel about the category Women of Rock, helpful or hurtful? Is it still I, I find it exactly what it is, yeah. okay? It's an oral history of women in rock and roll. What do you want to call it? I mean, come on. Yeah. That's what it is. You don't find it hurtful in any way that we still have Not gendered categories. Not even a drop. Why do you think a girl's strapping it on? I mean, we, oh, come on. It's girls strapping it on. Yep. You know? I'm not going to say just, 
you know, uh, it's a, it's a, a, about bands. I have to say, this is about a girls' band. It's different. It is different. So, you can't live with that? Sorry. <laughs> Move on. You don't have to stay in this room. You don't have to listen to the show. Move on. You know, think about it. I mean, I still, on, on radio, go, this is one of the finest chick bands I've heard. Out does guys I've heard, you know. I mean, I, you know, you got to call it as it is. You came up with the name and it makes it. Okay? It makes it. You don't have to change that name. And, and if anybody finds it offensive or something, it, 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 well, stop. now I'm going to play them stop. your clip. I'm gonna be like, you play them my clip. This is Gania yeah. Raven. She's, a, you she's know, in the first all-girl band. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pioneer <laughs> in a lot she, of things. Now, mind. if she doesn't mind, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she got paid more for it. <laughs> <laughs> and then played and sang and got respected for who she was, you know. And never gave a blowjob. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she never gave a blowjob. So there. <laughs> Don't forget that. This is important shit. Can you really... That you are a very funny chick. You're very funny. Yeah, you are. You yeah. are. You're very funny. It's a dry wit. Oh, <laughs> absolutely fucking funny. And never gave a blowjob. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gotta put that somewhere. <laughs> gotta really no, do. I'm telling you, stickers like buttons. Kenya like, Raven never gave a BJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I was begged. I was begged by <laughs> names for a blowjob. Never happened. Take you away. You and your either. three minutes single. Get out of here. <laughs> What? Um, is there anything that you want to talk about that you're working on now? Yeah, what? I'm working on a CD right now called Inside Job. And I'm uh, really excited about it because, well, number one, it's taken way, way too long. But uh, I'm excited about it because it's got a lot of my writing on it. And... Uh, and these songs just, uh, not that there hasn't been albums where, you know, where I didn't do what I'm doing right now. But, you know, I, I'm excited because, excuse me, I'm belching. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited because I just belched in front of cameras <laughs> and never gave a blowjob. But anyway, <laughs> I'm excited because I think it's coming out really good. Can't wait to play you something. Are you planning... Are you planning on, on working and creating until you can't do it anymore? Is it important to you to be... You know something? Uh, I think when it's over, it'll be over. I, I don't have a plan for that, you know? I mean, there are times that my head wants to boogie, but the body won't let me. <laughs> you know? I'm getting on in age, you know? But I think... Uh, th well, number one, the voice doesn't go. Maybe it loses octaves, but it doesn't go. Um, I think I will go until I can't go, you know? Yeah. See, a lot of my, my peoples are falling to the wayside. Just so upsetting about Bowie and Prince and so many parts of our lives, you know? And I always felt like, okay, I was not a breeder. I have no children and, uh, I feel like my records are my children, and I'm leaving that behind. And that's something that'll never go anywhere, but it's music. And that, to me, is my kid. That, to me, is my family, you know. So, you know, I feel good about my music. I'm about music, really. It's what it is. It's, you know, from a little girl to now, it was all about music. Everything else was a struggle to get through it. Yeah. That's a good line. Okay. Is there anything that I left out that is, I mean, I'm sure there's like tons more stuff. Like you said, uh, stories, anything no, that's really important. No, we talked about, we did, we did, I did mention we're doing a documentary. Uh, mentioned about the play. Yep. Uh, the CD, the new CD. I think we covered it, sweetheart. Yeah? Yeah, I think you did a great job in what you're doing there. Oh, Your thanks. questions. Thank they you. They were good. They're not. 
I the normal. I didn't have to ask half of them because you like no. <laughs> because I you mean, can't shut me up, and I know that. No, it was cool. I was like checking stuff off as you were going. Well, you're not really hard to talk to, okay? Yeah. Oh, thanks. You're really not you hard that? to talk to. <laughs> Did you get that on camera? Not hard to Mr. talk to, Mr. Demille. <laughs> it's okay, Mr. Demille. <laughs> Regular Oprah Winfrey over here. Oprah! That's Oprah! <laughs> BJ over here. Oprah! 